uh, which Vincent has been asked to um, address, and that is how technology can be used appropriately to provide flexibility and what kind of learner stands to benefit most. Thanks, Jim. Well, as you notice, I was at the end of the queue there, like, you know, so by now uh, I should be feeling very badly, very bad. Um, and I should say that, uh, not for the first time in my life, I'm masquerading as an expert in a particular field that I know very little about. Uh, but I am standing, I think, on the shoulders of some giants in this space, uh, particularly at IT Sligo, in the form of Brian Mulligan and Kieran Tobin and Gavin Clinch, who are you're part of the uh, Centre for Online Learning and which have really spearheaded a lot of the activities that I'm going to talk about today uh, within IT Sligo. And I think, uh, I suppose, the Institute has been at this for, for about 13 years now online, like, you know, so there's a, there's a bit of experience built up there. But I should say it was born of necessity. It wasn't born, you know, of a desire to, uh, to actually get into online. It was born of necessity. The engineering courses were going down, the numbers were going down, the science courses were going down. Uh, and in order to take up that slack and to uh, drive uh, new initiatives, yes, uh, online learning became part of that because we had early adopters there, uh, as we said. But that's why we are in the area mainly of STEM, uh, engineering, science courses, uh, online courses in particular. Like, you know, so we currently have uh, 1,450 online students. Uh, for the HEA purposes, where they're classified as part-time, mostly. So, hello, HEA. Um, <laughs> But uh, I suppose contrary to some of the perception, like, you know, uh, the breakdown of that w uh, is actually, well, from L6 to L9, but the L6, uh, an entry level, is about 24% of that, of that number. Uh, the big one is uh, L7 at 42%, uh, L8's at 24% and 10% on the L9 at the postgraduate level, which is slightly different to what, what people may think in terms of where that opportunity is. Uh, it's grown organically at IT Sligo, and uh, I should say that I'm so far uh, on, the dark, on the dark side by now that I should have a black cape on me and a black helmet. Uh, but uh, that's what I, so my concern as, as president and head of the strategic team is, how do I take something that's grown organically, that's had early adopters, that has permeated out from that source uh, and grown in a way that you know, has been, become a key differentiator for the Institute, how do I now try to formalise that, taking a vision and strategy now that's coming laterally, as Mark says, uh, and posing that an organically growing thing? These are key aspects because what I can't afford to do is to kill off that goodwill, that organic growth, and replace it with some structured way that actually doesn't give me the end goals that I particularly want to see. So the, the questions, of course, that I've been asked, like, you know, so... Uh, how can technology be used appropriately to provide a flexibility and what kind of learners stand to benefit most? Well, if I take the, um, the second part first, the type of learner that we have uh, is, uh, is part-time, uh, remote, international. International and triggered, when we talk about international, these are not Indians and Malaysians. These are Irish diaspora mainly who are abroad and see, uh, want to continue their professional development through that and are aware of courses in Ireland and come to IT Sligo, but they then act as a conduit to others, but uh, and in essence, a lot of these, uh, the, these international students that are, are based abroad are actually Irish in nature. It is about seeking continuous professional development, uh, it's about lifelong learning, uh, and it's their adults, and the vast majority of them are workers. So, um, so they are, the learners are employed, they're in industry, or they're at the springboard level seeking to get back into full-time type of education. I should say that despite this 13 years uh, and online experience in STEM, the penetration into the full-time courses is probably on a par with anybody else. So, so there's a big challenge there. We, I would say, are at the forefront of some of this online activity, yet we haven't brought that back into the full-time face-to-face courses in a way that I would have expected it to have happened by now. So there's a big aspect of why is that? And a lot of it, I think, is down to that funding. A lot of it is about the time, availability, incentivization, CPD, etc. But there is a big question there as to why that hasn't happened. So it's mostly in the upskilling. It's mostly in cross-skilling, even for pharma, pharma graduates getting into the new biopharma 
where we move from small molecules to large molecules. There's a lot of that going on, and we are the online provider of the National Institute for Bioprocessing, etc. On the technology side, technology, you know, used appropriately to provide uh, flexibility. Of course, technology is essential to online, so we're, you know, so there's, that's, that's a given, like, you know. The whole idea of blended education, the flipped classroom, uh, from our point of view, that does add value. That's where we're trying to get to. Um, whatever the percentage of that, uh, uh, you know, uh, involvement of the blended side of things, but whether we're, um, whatever the percentage of technology versus face-to-face, -face, the technology works for us, uh, and it works all the way from L6 to L9. It's not in a particular point along that uh, framework. It works all across that framework. And we are seeking to get into the second level, like you know, further back down the line, a MOOC on the transition from a second level to third level is underway through the Teaching and Learning Forum, uh, through the uh, CUA and uh, uh, the uh, Midwest, or Shannon Consortium, as it's rightly called. Um, so it's not technology is the problem. Technology is not the problem in this case. There's a lot of technology. It's how you adopt that and what you adopt. And we're going from the sorts of online quizzes uh, all the way through to online labs and everything in between uh, and the fully online. So there are sectoral issues as to what technology should be adopted. Is there a means of getting a, a single type of technology or should we have a multiplicity of things uh, and that diversity that John talked about? I just want to talk about a little bit about the flexibility uh, and to maybe flip that a little bit itself. So of course the most flexible learner is uh, they are able to choose the time and they're able to choose the place of their learning. That's, the, in a sense, the definition of the most flexible. So it's the freedom not to be in the classroom, uh, you know, in essence. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, what we are seeing, though, in, our, in, our, in, in IT Sligo is our full-time students are now feeling that they are disadvantaged, even though they've got the face-to-face. -face. They're feeling disadvantaged because they know that there are online resources available to the online students, and they want access to those online facilities. They want access to the... To the uh, the lectures that are, uh, that are there, that are stored uh, electronically, because they feel they're being disadvantaged, even though they have the face-to-face -face opportunity. So it's, a, it's another interest in the side. But I suppose as uh, a member of the dark side, uh, from a management point of view, there are other issues about flexibility. So I'm just, uh, like, just going to give six of these like, uh, as, as they come to me, like, you know, but it's in relation to the flexibility of the institutes now. These are institutes side of things as opposed to flexibility of individual learner, which I think we have to give <coughs> as a given. But it's about the course development. Uh, one of the issues we face is the, the involvement of companies in that course development. Yeah, that happens uh, in the normal face-to-face -face side of things as well. So, but the, uh, the level of company input into uh, courses, shared curriculum with other institutions. Uh, we're involved, of course, with the Conrad Oster Alliance. We were involved as of last week with the, uh, making our presentation to become a technological university. That asks all questions about the provision of courses across all those institutions, not just your own individual institution, but how are we going to provide courses across these clusters, across these wider uh, engaged institutions. So it's about the building of those programs. Arising out of that, of course, is credits and the credit accumulation, and that credit accumulation that could happen across multiple institutions. How do we take that on board? Bologna type of processes as well that come into play. So uh, credit accumulation across institutions, and I think what we're already seeing is uh, how we can provide specialist courses in those, the, the, the third and fourth years for generic courses in engineering and science, where the specialism exists in one institution, it doesn't exist in the wider institutions, and that can be brought online and provided as a specialism in that way. And I think this is another issue for institutions working together. The combining of, uh, uh, of RPL and online learning, a very difficult aspect. Uh, we're working now through the CUA and myexperience.ie to recognize that prior learning. Uh, and we have examples of where apprenticeships, we're doing a, uh, an RPL on apprenticeships, giving them credit for that which brings them into an L6 bridging program, which they then complete online, and then that takes them into the L7, L8s as well, either face-to-face -face or online. One of the things that's happening now, which is, is going to happen, is uh, learners uh, staying on in companies, work experience, computer scientists going off in third year, doing work experience. They want to stay, the company wants them. And now we're being asked that they become 
they do their fourth year and final year online in the company, online training. What does the HEA say? They're no longer a student because now they're off your books, they're online, they are not in your Oregon model. Big issue for the dark side. So uh, that's, that's another point. And I think then there's the disaggregation of learning and evaluation. And it's the evolution of MOOCs. And uh, you know, how uh, we get then from their learning through a MOOC to the competency-based assessment that the institutes provide. So they're taking their learning individually, but they're asking us then to, to assess them that, that. So the disaggregation of the learning and the evaluation is another issue for us. So, um, so I think, as I say, to finish up, it's not just about the flexible learner, it's about the flexible institute, institutions working <laughs> together, using technology across a wide range of learners, across a wide range of institutes. And I think it's, um, it's how the institutes themselves can become more flexible in this space, uh, and how CPD can help the individual uh, learner, but it should become out outcomes oriented. We've had a multiplicity of people doing CPD who never translate that training into real uh, online provision, and, and that next year you'll find them in the same, have taken the same course again because they've forgotten it. So it has to become much more output orientated, much more help in that space. So uh, with that, uh, I'll uh, go back uh, into my space machine. Thank you very much. Thank you.